The last type of reaction is redox reactions. And with redox reactions, the main event that's going on there is a transfer of electrons. So one of your reactants is losing electrons and your other reactant is gaining electrons. So if you look at this example right here, which is magnesium solid reacting with oxygen gas to produce magnesium oxide, the magnesium in the reactant is magnesium atom. So it has 12 electrons which you can check in the periodic table the magnesium in the product side is magnesium ion because this is an ionic compound so magnesium ion is mg2 plus which means it only has 10 electrons so what we notice here is that going from the magnesium in the reactant to the magnesium in the product we have gone from 12 electrons in the magnesium to 10 electrons so it has given away two electrons so if you look at the oxygen gas here again this is the oxygen element so it has eight electrons electrons originally in the atom form and then here it's the oxide ion which means gain a couple of electrons to make it 10 electrons so the oxygen has gone from 8 to 10 so it's gain electrons so as you can see the reason the reaction occurs is because magnesium donates electrons and oxygen accepts those electrons there is a terminology you want to get familiar with with respect to redox which is that oxidation means the loss of electrons or the giving away of electrons so in this case magnesium is oxidized and reduction means the gain of electrons so the oxygen is actually gaining electrons so the oxygen is reduced. The oxidizing agent is the species the reactant that is reduced so in this case because oxygen is reduced oxygen is our oxidizing agent vice versa reducing agent is oxidized since our magnesium is oxidized that means magnesium is a reducing agent. Instead of having to count the total electrons as we just did here we can also also use something called an oxidation number. It's just a, a method that chemists develop to help us figure out whether a particular reactant is gaining or losing electrons. The calculation is not difficult to do, but it's even easier if you just memorize a lot of these rules here to assign the oxidation number. If you have an ion, its oxidation number is just whatever the charge on the ion is. If you have an element, the oxidation number is just zero. So like copper has an oxidation number zero, Cl2 has an oxidation number of zero. If you have a compound, the total oxidation number is zero, but you can then figure out the oxidation number of the individual elements by adding them up in such a way that they add up to zero. Now, whenever you have a compound like this, you're going to have to start with something that you know first, like Na would be uh, one that you know always has a positive one charge because it's group one. Therefore, the Cl would automatically be negative one. Now, what about if you have a covalent compound like water, for example? Whenever you have a covalent compound or a bunch of nonmetals, you're going to have to follow the rules that are listed here. This is based on importance. So the top one here is the most important, follow the next and the next. So if you have something like H2O, what you need to do is start with the H, which is going to assign that plus one because there's two H, that means there's plus two. The total is neutral, so it's zero. So then the oxygen must be negative two to balance out the plus two there. Okay. So let's work on this problem on how to assign oxygen states using the rules that we just discussed. So I'll pick a few of these species that are listed here to assign oxidation numbers for. So let's try first CO2. This is one where all you have are non-metals. So then you're going to have to think about that non-metal series that I was showing you earlier in the notes and use that as a way to assign the oxidation numbers starting with the elements that's highest on that list. If you look at both carbon and oxygen, carbon is not even on the list but oxygen is so we're going to start with oxygen and according to that list oxygen is going to have an oxidation number of negative two so i'm going to put that on the top there in red just to distinguish that with the numbers that i'm going to write in the bottom and the numbers in the bottom is just the total charge for all the oxygens there so each oxygen is negative two so if you have two oxygens then it's going to be negative four i need that because that would allow me to figure out what the oxidation state of my carbon is remember that the sum of the two has to equal the total charge of the species which is zero in this case for carbon dioxide so therefore my carbon must be plus four let's pick another species now let's go with an ion so we have the sulfate ion so42 minus and again what we would do here is look at s and o the two elements that we have and see which one we have to assign first again this is a case where we, all we have are non-metals so we look at the list that i showed you before in the notes and oxygen appears higher 
here on that list compared to sulfur, which is a group 6a element. So we're going to assign the oxidation state for oxygen first, which is negative 2 again. And therefore, 4 oxygens is going to give us negative 8. And in this case, it's an ion that has a total charge of minus 2. So we want to make sure that the sum of the sulfur and the 4 oxygens give us negative 2. That tells us that the sulfur in this case must be positive 6. So for those of you who were looking at that list earlier and saw that group 6a has to be negative 2, again, I want to remind you that it's negative 2 if nothing else is present in there that would change it. In this case, oxygen is higher in priority, so that has to be assigned first. Let me try an ionic compound now. So let's take a look at FeCN3. Whenever you have an ionic compound, it's best to separate them out first into the ions. And the way you do that is just by your rules in nomenclature. The iron is going to be separated from the polyatomic ion of Cn. Now, here you remember from nomenclature that Cn is Cn minus, so it's really Fe3 plus and 3 Cn minus. And then from there, you separately assign the oxidation state for each of the elements. The iron is obviously easy because it's just a 3 plus charge on it, so that's going to be a plus 3 oxidation state. The Cn minus, we can take a look separately in this context right here, just looking at that, right? Because the 3 really doesn't matter. That just means there's 3 of these guys. But to assign the oxidation state of each of the element, I can look at just that one polyatomic ion. Carbon and nitrogen, they're both non-metals, so we have to go to that non-metal list and check which of those two appear on on the higher priority list. Carbon doesn't appear on the list, but nitrogen is the last thing on the list, which is the group 5A. So we're going to assign nitrogen in this case as a negative 3 because it's a group 5 element. So if it's negative 3, then carbon plus negative 3 has to equal negative 1 because that's the overall charge of that polyatomic ion. So the carbon in this case must be plus 2. One of the benefits of knowing oxidation states is you can use it to figure out whether you have something that that's oxidized or something that's reduced. So oxidation is shown by an increase in the oxidation number and reduction is shown by a decrease in oxidation number. Let's work on one of these examples to show you how this concept is applied reaction number two here that has all these species in here. First step is to figure out what the oxidation state is for each of the elements. Hopefully at this point you're either memorized or remember enough of that list of rules of determining oxidation state. But with hydrogen and oxygen together, hydrogen is assigned first as plus one. And there's two of these, so it's plus two. That means the oxygen has to be negative two. Aluminum is a free element, so it's going to have an oxidation state of zero. Manganese and oxygen. Well, manganese is a metal, but it has multiple charges. So unless we figure out the oxygen first, we can't tell what the manganese would be. So we start with oxygen being negative 2, which means this is negative 8. And so manganese must be plus 7 to balance that out. Aluminum hydroxide. This is a, a complex ion. We just start again with aluminum. The standard charge is plus 3. And then oxygen, hydrogen again, plus 1, negative 2. So no change there. And then the manganese at the end here is going to be negative 2, and then we have negative 4, obviously, on this side, and then that causes us to give positive 4 for the manganese in manganese oxide. What we need to do is figure out which elements have a change in oxidation number. My hydrogen, my oxygens actually stay exactly the same, so that means that nothing happens to them, and that's okay. Not everything has to be oxidized or reduced in a redox reaction. Uh, water really just serves as a solvent, in this case, to allow those ions to form. So let's take a look at this species where an actual change occurs. Aluminum is one. I notice that I have an oxidation number of zero in the reactant side and it becomes plus three in the product side. So that means there's an increase, right? Means oxidation has occurred on aluminum because that means you've lost some electrons. For you to, for that element to become more positive in its oxidation number, it has to lose some electrons. Let's take a look at any other element that has a change in oxidation number and we notice that manganese is the other element that has a change. So manganese goes from positive 7 to positive 4. So that means there's a decrease in oxidation number and that would mean that there's a reduction occurring for manganese. So then what we can say is that aluminum is oxidized and manganese is reduced. Now what about the oxidizing and the reducing agent? So an oxidizing agent is the reactant that causes things to be oxidized, but that agent itself is reduced. 
reduced or contains the elements that's reduced. The compound that contains manganese is the permanganate ion. So the permanganate ion is the oxidizing agent. And then if you look at the reducing agent, well, aluminum is the element that's oxidized, but aluminum is also the reactant itself. So therefore, aluminum is the reducing agent. So one issue with redox reaction is that it's not as easy to balance it as you have with the other reactions. This is because we often have ions in redox reactions that requires you to balance both the number of elements as well as the charges. You might look at that aluminum and silver ion going to aluminum ion and silver. That might look like a balance equation because you have one of each of the element, but you're going to have to worry not just about the element number, but also how many electrons are existing on the left side of the equation versus the right side of the equation. And that's where we need more advanced method of balancing equations, which is called a half reaction method. So the first thing you do when you have an equation like this is you identify which species is oxidized and which species is reduced. So that means you're going to have to assign the oxidation state for all of the species first. So aluminum would be zero, silver ion would be plus one, that one would be plus three, and then the silver element would be zero. And so we can see that the aluminum is oxidized because it goes from zero to plus three, and then the silver is reduced because it goes from plus one to zero. Once we identify that, we separate them out into half reactions. The first half reaction is the oxidation half reaction where aluminum goes to aluminum three plus, and then reduction is the silver ion going to the silver solid. Now, once we have that, what we have to do is then add the electrons to balance out the charges. And the way we do that is the following. Each electron is worth negative one. On the left side, our charge currently is zero because aluminum is three elements, so that has an oxidation state of zero. Aluminum three plus has an oxidation state of plus three. So we have a zero, we have a plus three. The reasonable thing to do is to add three negative one on the right side so that when you add that plus the plus three, you get zero, which is equal to the left side. And so that's what we do here. We add three electrons. Once we add the three electrons, that balances out the charges on both sides. If you look at the silver, the silver is plus one on the left side, zero on the right side. So that means adding one electron, which is negative one, would make this side become zero in total and then that would equal to the right side. One point I want to clarify here is that it doesn't necessarily always have to be zeros on both sides. Sometimes it's plus two on both sides. Sometimes it's negative one on both sides. In this specific example, it happens to be zero on both sides. Once you have the electrons, you need to equalize your electrons because you have to have conservation of charges, just like you have to have conservation of mass. So in this case, to balance out the electrons, I'm going to have to multiply the electrons at the bottom by three, and the top one will just remain like that because it's already three. So that's what I'm doing here. I have the top equation looking the same. The bottom equation is three times the starting equation. And then I multiply that across, so that means I have three electrons, three silver ions, Ion and three silver element. After that, I'm going to add the two reactions back together. So here's aluminum going to that, right? Aluminum ion, three electrons. And then here's the, the equation that I just multiplied in and I add the two of these together. This is what I end up getting, okay? And so that is your balance equation. Now, the way you can tell that it's the balance equation is because if you look at the elements, there's one aluminum, there's also one aluminum here, there's three silver and there's also three silver here. But in addition, you also want to check the charges. So aluminum is zero. Silver is plus one and there's three silver, so it's going to be plus three. So the entire charge on the left side is positive three. You go to the right side, the aluminum ion is plus three. The silver element is zero, so three times zero is still zero. So overall, you have a charge of plus three on the right side. That means you have plus three and plus three, so they're equal as well. So that means both the charge and the elements are equal to each other. That's unlike when we started with this equation, even though the number of elements are the same on both sides, but the charge on the left side is only plus one and the charge on the right side is plus three. So that's how we know that that equation is not balanced.